Greetings, my fellow Americans, and welcome to the latest episode of the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. Today we're going to talk about a subject that's a little bit closer to home, although again, as is very common, Montana takes the practice that has been largely adopted on a national level and makes it worse. <laughs> it, it's, the problem is when you have in the existence of something that can be done wrong, Montana will take it to the extreme, and they'll take advantage of it, and they'll run full blank with it. Just what it is. And that subject today is a fact, is the practice of judges having attorneys ghostwrite for them. Essentially, if anyone knows what the term ghostwriting means, it means having someone else write for you. Well, a, ju a judge's job is to issue rulings, to decide laws, to set precedent. What a judge passes down becomes verbatim presidential law. It will set precedents, and when someone else's case is very similar, it will be the foundation upon which the future laws and rulings rely upon. But what happens when a judge doesn't write their own orders? When they have the, allow the prevailing attorney, or in more cases than not, the prosecutors, write the orders and then just sign them. Just we'll sign them and call them good. The judges are not doing their jobs. The judges are, are deferring their jobs to individuals who have a clear bias and prejudice. And oftentimes what happens is that not only is prejudicial language written into the orders and declaratory rules and conclusions that are not even based upon may, what may even be heard in the ruling, but oftentimes elements and decisions that are not even made by the judge or even discussed in the open courtroom are written to the law because the attorney sees an opportunity to just go ahead and write something in that they want on behalf of either the party or, in the case of prosecutors, on behalf of the state. Or they'll exclude things that are critically important to a defense or to another party. They'll exclude rights and privileges that may have been preserved at the hearing but are denied by simply omitting them in the order. Because this is not actually the judge's opinion. This is the opinion of the person who won. Is, is the ideal, pristine, as I want it written example. And that's just, it's so wrong on so many levels. Because not only are the judges being lazy, and there's no other word for it but lazy, but they were allowing other people to set precedent and law. They were allowing people to interpret aspects of law and even to grant relief that was never even discussed or requested or possibly even denied during the hearing or trial, or whatever proceeding you're in front of, the, the judge for. The practice of adoption of verbatim orders, written by prevailing parties, has been criticized widely across the country. It has been denounced by appellate courts. It has been frowned upon by the United States Supreme Court, although the Supreme Court continues to allow it. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court has, has noted in their findings in multiple cases that orders, findings, and conclusions of fact or findings of, of, of fact and conclusions of law, they take the form of conclusory statements that are not necessarily supported by the hearings and the proceedings. They're just conclusions that the prevailing party wants to be written to law, and the judges sign them. There's a potential for overreaching, as I mentioned, you know, adding additional elements to the, to the ruling that otherwise may not have been there, possibly omitting issues that they didn't prevail on, hypothetically, if they lose... Like, say, for instance, a prosecutor is, is says, you know, makes a motion for something and loses that motion. If they're the ones writing the conclusion order, they just omit that. We didn't lose. We're just not going to write into the order. And the problem also is that it allows for exaggeration. It allows the party who wants their client, whether it be the state or whether it be a personal party or a corporation or whatever, to look the best, the best PR possible. And that's what you get written into law because the judges, more than not, simply don't even read what is given. They just sign it. They don't review it. They don't edit it. They don't add to it. They simply sign it and adopt it. So what happens when judges routinely let someone else do this and basically don't do their own jobs? And as I commonly do, I'm going to bring an example to your attention. This is not a Montana case. This is an Alabama case. And the person's name is Doyle Lee Ham, spelled H-A-M-M -M if you want to look it up. 
Doyle was convicted of murder in 1999. He murdered a hotel clerk. He confessed to it. There's no doubt whatsoever. There's been no effort whatsoever to undo this or to claim that he's innocent. And nothing about this is an innocence claim. However, in a murder trial, you have two phases. You have the jury trial part, and then you have the sentencing part. And it's very critical in the sentencing part because a jury gets to decide whether to commit you to life in prison, in most cases, or to death. That's right. The jury gets to decide if you die. So what happens when the jury just thinks you're this really violent, horrifically terrible, evil person with no remorse? They're going to sentence you to death, right? So what happens when the person is actually retarded. And I, and I don't say that in a derogatory manner. I mean the person is mentally defective with an IQ of 66. He demonstrates clear signs of this throughout his history, his medical diagnoses. He's got medical history of fetal alcohol syndrome. He has impulse control issues that relate to, to uh, inability to determine right from wrong. Based upon his, his mental handicap, None of this information gets to the jury. And why? Well, because he was given a really poor public defender initially. But the aspect that came down in this was that there was an 89-page order that was signed. It was very horrifically detailed about how, the, how detailed his history of his criminal behavior made absolutely no reference to this mitigation evidence. That's, by the way, that's what it's called when you're talking about things that are that are that may affect a ruling or a judgment or how to rule. It's called mitigation evidence, i.e. I, it's mitigating information that, that may or may not affect your opinion of what, of what sentence should be passed down. And if this is excluded from a jury entirely, how can the jury possibly be said to be making a decision based upon all the information? Well, the problem is this 89-page memorandum opinion passed down by the judge was submitted late Friday afternoon, signed early Monday morning. The judge has since come back and said he had, he'd never read it. It was written entirely and solely by the prosecutor. And when the judge signed it, he was so hasty and signed it, he didn't even remove the word proposed from it. It reads, proposed memorandum opinion, right at right his header. He didn't even bother to remove the word proposed from it. That's how hasty he was to get it out. He didn't care. He wrote whatever the prosecutor gave him, he signed. <sighs> it excluded all the mitigation evidence. It was defamatory. It was horrifically slanted to make uh, Doyle appear to be this just insanely evil, wicked, terrible person, when in fact he was a mentally handicapped person who very possibly could not have even had an understanding fully of what he was doing. And that information was never given to a jury, never given to any critical, and every attempt to bring it back before the court relies upon this 89-page order, and it keeps getting shot down because of this 89-page order, that nobody can seem to get thrown out, because every judge that listens to it says, well, you haven't proven that the content is wrong, so the facts mentioned in there are true, but if it's written in a a prejudicial, exaggerated capacity, that doesn't bother the judges, apparently, in the higher courts. It was petitioned at one point to go before the U.S. Supreme Court for review. The Supreme Court apparently denied it. They've not been able to find any record of them actually reviewing it. But of note on this particular case, when the 11th Circuit Court reviewed this case, and you can look it up, by the way, it's the, the case note is 620 Federal Appendix, page 752. And again, for anybody who doesn't understand legal notation, that'll be the 620th volume of the Federal Appendix, page 752. They even entered a footnote about this. And I'm actually going to read this because it's important to know. This is actually their, their actual words. We take this opportunity to once again strongly criticize the practice of trial courts' uncritical wholesale adoption of the proposed orders or opinions submitted by the prevailing party. It's right there. 11th Circuit Court decision. And this is this language is reflected all across the country. This isn't just this court. This isn't a one case. This is not a one-off. This is a practice that is wholly and widely criticized across the country. 
in spite of the clear and flagrant issues that have been presented, Ham remains in prison. And I'm not saying he shouldn't be in prison, by the way. Of especially, he is guilty. He has confessed to it. He's never denied it. He's never come back and said, oh, you know, the only thing he really went to trial for was to determine whether he was going to be put to death or not. And that was really the only reason he went to trial. was because if he took a plea deal, or he pled to it, you know, he wasn't being offered a chance of getting off of it, off of the death penalty. Who had been left, left up to the judge rather than to a jury. You might also, by the way, I should make a side note, because as I was reading and researching this, another aspect came up to Doyle Hand's case. He actually made international news, particularly on the subject of death penalty. While in prison, he developed lymphatic cancer, and he also had a long history of intravenous drug abuse. Consequently, it was difficult for them to find a good vein to put a lethal injection into. So they they made an attempt, even though doctors said it would be difficult, that it would be cruel and inhumane, the state of Alabama still decided they wanted to kill him by lethal injection before his cancer could kill him. So we had a big note of rushing the process, spent three hours trying to kill him with lethal injection. Failed. Finally had to give up. Couldn't do it. Because of the lymphatic cancer and his collapsed veins from intravenous drug use. Afterwards, he prevailed in a settlement with the state of Alabama, which basically said, okay, we agree we're not going to make a, a second attempt to, to, uh, to uh, execute you, and and basically converted his sentence over to life in prison, where, to the best of my understanding, he still remains to this day. But the most important significance of this case is how it relates to the idea that a judge, without any kind of oversight or protection of any kind can adopt something as written by a prosecutor who is obviously going to be biased, obviously going to be prejudiced. A judge's job is to create a decision between two adverse sides of an argument, regardless of whether it's a criminal issue or a civil issue. Their job is to be impartial. You've heard, you may have heard me use the term impartial remedy of justice or a partial administration of justice. It can't be impartial when you have a clearly biased and prejudiced party writing up the decisions and the mindset of the judge. And the judge doesn't even read it, just signs it and writes it into law. The problem is that in Montana, at least in Flathead, and I'm absolutely confident this is, this is true in other counties as well, but especially in Flathead, where I've seen this over and over. I've actually sat in court and watched this myself personally dozens of times, probably hundreds of times, where the judges will simply say, party submit your proposed facts, finding conclusions of law. The parties will submit, or they order one side, in the case of the prosecutor. Now, this is usually how it is in civil cases. In, in criminal cases, they simply have the order of the prosecutor to prepare the order. The rationality, the findings of facts, conclusions of law, whatever it is, the prevailing party's form is always the one adopted verbatim. There is no, oh, this is a good format, let me add my own thoughts to it, da 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 da, da. No, it is verbatim whatever the other side gives. They don't want to work. They don't want to do their job. They don't want to be judges. They just want to be figureheads. They want to have the public, I don't know, adoration perhaps, recognition, the elitism of their office, but they don't want to do the work. As a consequence, all these issues where an order that may not even be something the judge even talked about, considered, thought about, is written in the law because the judge doesn't even read what he's signing. Okay, oh, I got the fi you got the papers from the prosecutor's office, let me see him. Da, 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 da. In Flathead County, Montana, we have one day a week called Law Day. One day. Thursdays. You don't have criminal proceedings every day of the week. Oh, you have your first appearances in justice court. But all 99% of all proceedings, when it comes to law or, or criminal law, happen on Thursdays. One judge does the work for the whole court one day a week because they don't want to work. They actually got a fourth judge to be appointed to this court so they could actually, t they wouldn't have to worry about, you know, because before there were three judges in our district 
and it never failed, if every judge takes their turn, one judge is always going to have two times a month they have to do the law, law calendar and the criminal calendar, and they don't want to. So they brought a fourth judge in so they could actually just have an extra week off. It's insane. The prospect of handling a criminal justice system with one, with, that, could ha that has the volume for four judges, has the population and the amount of cases going through that needs four judges, only has crime day one day a week because these judges don't want to do their jobs. And they turn around and they have the prosecutors do their work. They will sit up there. They let the prosecutors issue things. I have sat in court and watched these judges go turn to a prosecutor and say, what's the law on this? You're supposed to be the one knowing the law. Go sit in your chambers and look it up. You don't turn to the prosecutor and ask for what the law is on this. It's not your job to turn to them for guidance. You are the judge. You are the one who's supposed to be in charge of that chamber. But more than not, there is no separation between the judiciary and the executive branches of Flathead County. The judges are figureheads that are there to exist for one purpose and one purpose only, to create a pretense of law and a pretense of administration so that we meet constitutional prerequisites. But they're not doing their jobs. They're sitting up there, they're making rulings, they're making orders, most often in, in favor of the state, very rarely in favor of, of private parties, defendants. It, it's an impossible scenario when you have a person that's so powerful, they can basically say or do whatever they want to in court, and then the prosecutor writes up whatever order they're going to sign, they sign it, and then they'll sit back and let the, court, let the appellate court deal with it. When you have, I mean, across the country, everyone hears always the these decisions about this person, this judge did this, and this judge dissented. Why do you think that is? It's because the judges actually think. There's a reason why we have not had a Flathead County judge actually apply for a, a state Supreme Court case, uh, position in decades. Why? Because they'd actually have to think. They'd actually have to work. And they don't want to work. They want to sit around, collect a paycheck, do the, I'm going to put on the robe, the hammer, I'm going to sit around and pretend like I'm listening to things. I'm going to ignore 90% of what I'm supposed to do to set up a pretense that I'm actually organizing this, but it's really the prosecutor who's in charge of the whole show. These judges sit down and have lunch with the prosecutors on a regular basis. They go out, they socialize at the, at the golf course. They socialize at the, at the, at the uh, um, private clubs. They don't have a separation. These are friends. And remember, as I've said before, attorneys are judges. They become they are judges before they are attorneys before. They get to work with these people on a regular basis. They become judges. They keep those friendships. There's no separation. And when they become prosecutors, there's no separation between the prosecutor's office and the judiciary office. So the judges allow the prosecutor to basically be their right-hand man. You go ahead and do my work for me, and I'll sit up here and just make you look good. And in, in fact, they actually both look good when you look at it from that perspective, because they're making each other look good. As with Doyle, the orders written for these judges in Montana are heavily written with prejudice. They offer, often gain relief that was never discussed or granted in court, often ignore decisions that make their make the state look bad. They're just, they're horrible decisions in most cases. And the, and the state Supreme Court refuses to even allow them to challenge. As I've mentioned in previous, in a previous podcast on unpublished opinions, the Supreme Court, when they realize that a district court order does not meet the standards of law, they simply make it an unpublished opinion so it can't be challenged. It doesn't get cited, it doesn't become precedental value, and it doesn't matter if it con conflicts with, with law or not. It doesn't matter what we said yesterday. You can't hold, it to us, hold us to it today. And you can't certainly can't hold us to it till tomorrow. We can do whatever we want to do so long as we don't have to actually have a, cite, cite, a cited opinion. In effect, the prevailing parties, more often than not the prosecutors, end up writing the law. They write the law. The judges, who are supposed to be the ones who are hired for this purpose, who are voted into office, they do nothing other than sit there and create the dynamic and the illusion, the pretense... Of, being, of creating law, but actually the ones creating the law 
are the ones who are writing the orders, and they're not the judges. 90% of the time, at least, in Flathead County. Prosecutors and attorneys ghostwrite for judges, plain and simple. They are creating the president, and they are creating the binding orders that inhibit civil liberties and civil rights. They strip people of rights, they strip people of liberty, they strip people of property. And the judges are the ones who get all the credit for it. Nationally, the Supreme Court frowns on it, but they allow it. It's been criticized by state bars across the country, and state bars across the country have even punished judges for this. But not in Montana. It's routine practice, it's accepted, it's adopted, and the Supreme Court ignores it. Because it's how it is done here. And I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that excuse. It's just how it's done. It's just how it's done in Flathead County. It's just how it's done in Montana. No, it's not about just how it's done. What is the law? What is right? What is justice? It's not about what the good old boy network has always done. It's about what needs to be changed to make it fair and equal to everybody. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, there's something called the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment says equal access to law. And equal access to law means equal treatment under the law. One individual, one group, one whatever cannot be desegregated or treated differently because that's just the way it's always been done. That's why we have to change. This, Yes, as I said, Montana makes it a whole lot worse. There is no review. There is no criticism. There is no attempt to go through and review any of this because the Supreme Court whitewashes it all. We only have one appellate court, and that's the state Supreme Court. We don't have an intermediate appellate court. The power is held by seven people in Helena, Montana, and that's where it stays, and places like Flathead are allowed to do whatever they want to do. And therefore, the Great Montana Conspiracy continues without obstruction. And there we have it. So what can we do about it? Obviously, the best thing is to do is get people out of office who actually have this kind of history. Ask these questions. Treat actual elected officials like judges like they're getting a job offer. Are you, Would you hire somebody without giving them an interview? Ask the questions. Ask the hard questions and ask where they stand on these issues. Because once they're in office, the damage is done. They're there for four years or more. As always... Thank you for your time, and I appreciate you listening. If you like what we're doing, please support us. The information should be in the uh, at uh, attachment to this video, the text. If it's not, please visit me on YouTube, like and subscribe. Make sure you also, if you can't find me on YouTube for some reason, or you want to check out the original source of this material, you can always go to monspiracy.podbean.com. That's where this, po this, this uh, podcast is originally posted, and it's seeded out to other sources. As always, if you like what we're doing, spread the word. The more people you tell us, tell about us, the more people that listen, the more people that watch, the more people that subscribe on YouTube, the larger our voice can be. As always, as I say at the end of these videos, please be safe, and whenever possible, please be free. Thank you.